Hey, your hair is looking pretty good there. Thanks. What do you do for hair loss? Yeah, it's a, a good question. I don't know if I feel comfortable sharing, but I guess since we're influencers, we have to. So here are our exact protocols, what we do now, what we've done in the past, and what we plan to do in the future for hair loss or hair growth. Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach for health. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. And I suppose by popular demand, today's podcast is, what do you do for hair loss or hair growth for that matter? So in today's episode, we will talk about our personal protocols for hair loss um, in a couple of different contexts. So yep. without further ado, um, who did your hair system last time? Yeah, uh, same, same person <laughs> as Michael Hearn. Uh, I always get asked, uh, who does my toupee? They say it looks great. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't have one. I'm not sure which way it is, but my wife always says that she would not be as attracted to me without hair. So it's kind of the, the one thing that she likes that I maintain. And as people know, um, if you extrapolate the average individual, average male out to about age 80, almost all of them have uh, significant male pattern baldness, like to a point where lots of most people would be telling them to shave it. Yeah, we can't all be Ronald Reagan's. Yeah. Did he have a hair but system? No. I don't think he did. We can all be Ronald Reagan's because science. Yes. If you choose your genetics correctly and are able to reasonably utilize science. Or if you don't choose your genetics correctly, but you're able to really leverage science. Yeah. One of the two. So to be clear, um, Dr. Gillette does not use a toupee or a hair system, um, which kind of shuts down our opportunity for hair system sponsors of the podcast, Yep. Um, but does give credibility to what you can do to prevent hair loss. Yeah, I guess I'm not a fake natty when it comes to hair. And on that topic, when we signed up to be uh, transparent givers of uh, clinical and scientific tools directly to the public, I guess we kind of also signed up to tell everyone everything about our medical histories, which we've basically already done, but we're just concentrating on hair today. Yeah. Now that we, uh, I finally have that term life insurance policy, I can actually <laughs> talk about these without having some auditor go dig that up and say, yeah, nope, you're losing hair. We're not going to cover you. Yeah. Because that's what they would be concerned about. But Def there's going to be, maybe that's a teaser to some other things that we'll talk about, um, like our PED or anabolic stacks. Yeah. Um, or our DEXA scans. Now people are going to be too distracted by that to pay attention to the hair yeah. loss part. Yeah. How many grams a day? I mean, a week <laughs> we're on. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I guess we can uh, get into our stack. Um, some of you that are listening to this may have listened to us talk about um, whether or not we're on dutasteride. Because I guess if we're not on dutasteride, then um, I guess if you prescribe dutasteride, then you have to be on it yourself. Otherwise, you really shouldn't be prescribing it. Is it, the, is it that way for every medication? Used to be. That's how most clinics are. You know, OB-GYN or urologist or family doc reaches a certain age. Um, you know, they're mid-50s and never prescribed hormones of any sort before. But um, for whatever reason, they decide to start HRT themselves. And then they split off, they have their own little clinic, and they prescribe the same hormone regimen that they happen to be on. Um, whether or not that's more good or bad, that helps a lot of people. And um, otherwise, the demand would be nowhere near, um, or the supply would be nowhere near meeting the demand. But unfortunately, it's not a one size fits all. Not everyone can just fix their iron deficiency and regrow their hair. Mm. So I guess... For your regimen, how do you address, uh, I guess, A, androgens in general, like testosterone, yep. and two, uh, DHT, which is still the, I guess, the biggest lever that most people are able to pull, yep. assuming you can utilize it over a long period of time? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it would be a lot easier if I was female. Um, <laughs> but since I'm male, I do like to have an, a slightly higher total androgen pool that we've talked about in the past. Than, uh, than I would if I was female, most likely. Females also benefit from testosterone and androgens as we've talked about. But um, there's a couple different ways. So um, there's, I'll kind of talk about these four main categories and we'll post a, a graphic or an image of some sort that kind of breaks them down. But it's a, uh, an anti-androgen, whether this is a topical or systemic. This is a growth 
agonist, fertilizer, if you will. But this could this could be many things. It could be anything from growth hormone to minoxidil, and then uh, micro trauma, um, or you know, of various sorts. This is micro needling. You could potentially even put laser into this category, and then um, blood flow or hypoxic tissue damage prevention. So basically, anything else that improves blood flow. This could be Tadalafil. Um, exercise? Yeah, exercise is a good one. Um, I didn't put in uh, like autoimmune issues in this case. I didn't put in um, like specific nutrients that would be addressing pathologies. Um, I, I didn't really talk about thyroid in, in this category. Okay, so but, let's assume that you have a, a euthyroid state. Yep. You're not iron, selenium, zinc yep. deficient. Kind of check off those boxes. Uh, make sure you're not you know, blackballing yourself. Yes. And then you can look at these other vectors. Yeah. And I'm not taking Nutrafol or any other uh, overly expensive. There goes our Nutrafol sponsorship. Wah, wah. Yeah. Or uh, any other kind of like poor value per what you get multivitamin for my hair. But I do check my vitamin status and I make sure that my thyroid's optimal. I check my ferritin. Um, I have two hemochromatosis, two HFE SNPs, two of the six that are kind of commonly checked. And uh, ferritin doesn't run high a ton, but we'll get into that a different day. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll start off with my stack when I am not desiring fertility within the next six to 12 months. And then I'll go into my fertility stack. If I am desiring fertility within the next six to 12 months, it's extremely di uh, different. And uh, frankly, a lot of our, the patients that see us that both want to keep their hair and have healthy babies without potential theoretical epigenetic risks, that's a lot of them um, because usually they're not going to come to us. Uh, you know, they'll go to one of the billion, uh, there's about 1 billion different cookie cutter telemedicine hair loss. Um, you know, they can't call themselves clinics, but like services that connect the patient with the provider. Yeah, yeah. And it, we talked about it previously. It's not going to, in most cases, cause infertility. But if you want the most, uh, the highest number of the most healthy sperms competing against each other, um, which just sounds great to me, then mm -hmm. you probably want to avoid these things in that six to 12 month period prior to conception. So what's your non-fertility hair loss stack? Yeah, um, as mentioned previously, I do like taking dutasteride usually twice per week. Um, and now when I'm completely done with fertility, because uh, it's kind of off and on without going into too much detail, um, I will take daily dutasteride. I love how my skin is on dutasteride. Um, I have relatively few CAG repeats. I'm uh, looking at... Uh, my heart pretty closely too, and I don't want a, a hypertrophic cardiac muscle, which uh, given that I'm a, like just given my body phenotype, tall, heavy, um, already borderline um, in some of the echocardiogram parameters, dutasteride is kind of another benefit for me there. And then extremely strong family history of prostate cancer, including metastatic in relatively early ages. Um, and also arguably still like already some prostate symptoms in my thirties. Uh, I like that. I like how I do on dutasteride quite a bit for me, literally just testosterone is more enough androgen for the androgen pool. And, um, yeah, the, the main downside of why I'm not taking daily dutasteride right now is because it's going to take longer to wash out and to have those, uh, theoretical epigenetic changes and also intratesticular uh, people call it intratesticular testosterone. It's really just intratesticular androgen receptor activation. Go back to normal. Um, yeah, I should, like, you know, when I'm not in a fertility period, I should also probably still be on ketoconazole. I'm not as good at it um, when I'm not. Um, but I don't add in things past that. Yeah, and you did do uh, an experiment at one point in time, a combination of, I guess, technically three different anti-DHT, um, I guess, nutraceuticals or pharmaceuticals. Yes. So maybe we rehash that a little bit. So this is the most DHT blockade you had ever done. Yeah, so the most I've ever done, um, for a period of, I think, six weeks, I took daily dutasteride, 0.5, daily finasteride, one mg, daily saw palmetto. I think it's a total daily dose was something like 1,200 mgs. Um, yeah, usually 320 is, is what's used in the study, sometimes slightly yeah, higher than that. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, I think it took about four-ish capsules per day. Sure. Mega dosing, it, macro yeah, dosing. Yeah, I mean, I, I was already on dutasteride and finasteride, so at that point I was adding it in. Uh, I knew I wasn't getting a whole lot of inhibition out of it, no matter how much I took. Um, 
And that's really the most. And I think I was still taking that uh, intelligent volumizing shampoo, which I call ketoconazole shampoo because it has 0.99% ketoconazole. It also has pumpkin seed oil, peppermint seed oil. I think a little bit more salt palmetto, which is probably not absolutely necessary, but some people like it to be in there. And topical caffeine, actually. Um, so that's, the, that's my max anti-androgen stack. Um, it was more of an experiment um, and I felt great on it. I never had, I don't think I've had side effects from um, any of these things. Uh, perhaps my urine stream was a bit, a little bit easier. Too powerful. <sighs> well, <laughs> probably not too powerful, but uh, just a little bit easier. Um, maybe a, since I've had a good amount of hair regrowth, especially in my crown compared to, I think I started finasteride first five or six years ago. Um, I'd say, yeah, I've likely made up some ground, um, from things other than the scalp. I've always been very prone to acne, even, uh, late into my twenties. And unless I'm on HCG, then it's generally not too bad. Yeah. I think that's a pretty good overview. Um, so you've been on as little as no anti, uh, DHT yep. vector and as much as three different vectors to try and suppress DHT. Yep. Um, how about growth agonists for yourself personally? Yeah, um, when I'm not in fertility phase, um, none. So, you know, I'm pretty happy with the thickness and density at this point. I don't see a reason to add, um, you know, a GHRH or BPC or GHKCU or minoxidil or latanoprost or any of these other kind of like growth agonist fertilizer category mm -hmm. things. Um, if I take one for another reason, then I do see a bit faster growth of hair, but I'm not taking one specifically for hair. Yeah. And I think that's a really reasonable approach. A lot of times, um, people are doing this in the opposite order. They're putting in the growth agonist first and not necessarily addressing yeah. the androgen component to the hair loss. Yeah. So you may see really good improvement for three months or six months, and then you take slow steps backwards because you're not really addressing and, and like giving yourself a higher ceiling of yep. how much hair you're able to maintain. So I think seeing what you're able to get out of just mm -hmm. addressing the DHT component, give that a good six, 12 months, even longer sometimes. Yep. A uh, really solid approach. How about micro trauma? Yeah. Um, when I'm not in fertility phase, I also do not do that. I really should. Um, when I am in fertility phase, I do like to get PRP. Um, microneedling when possible, especially if uh, someone can use a uh, salon grade microneedler like a skin pen, like the one we have for uh, our aesthetics procedures here. That's great. Intelligent also has a good microneedler. I really should add it, but uh, again, in general, I don't. Um, I guess I could say I'm a little overly happy with how things are because I'm not optimizing as much as I was early on when I was good with microneedling. I, back before Intelligent had their pen, I'd use the Derminator. Um, and now it's just not necessary for me at this point. Although alternate universe Kyle that n would never take any anti-androgen despite having a really good androgen pool. And instead, if I had started minoxidil five or six years ago, my hair would be nowhere the same quality now. Yeah. So you would be outpacing current Kyle those first three months you're on minoxidil. Yep. And you'd say, Hey, I don't need to do anything else. And then as you're running that race, you have kind of the tortoise versus the hare. Yeah, my or, hair would have peaked in high school. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, you know, my mid-twenties. Yeah. Anyways. Not that you were in high school in your mid-twenties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was homeschooled, so I definitely did not peak in high school. Yeah. Uh, next, you have <laughs> blood flow. So um, I understand you do a fair bit of exercise that's good for blood flow. Yeah. Yeah, and on top of that, uh, fairly often I take 2.5 megs to Dalafil. Uh, not directly for the hair, more so so they don't get up and pee at night. I like drinking a lot of water. I try to do the, you know, the trick where you don't drink more than about three ounces every 20 to 30 minutes the last couple hours of the day. Um, but yeah, I don't like to wake up because I feel like I need to urinate and Tadalafil helps me not do that. I probably take it an average two or three times a week. I'm supposed to take it every other day, but I... Every I, three and, I, three and a half doses per week. Yeah. Um, anyways, um, that's, that's kind of a, the full stack for non-fertility. Um, as you can see, other than the intelligent uh, ketoconazole shampoo, I do not like topicals whatsoever. I just like to 
take an, an oral, and if I'm going to do something, then I want it to have excellent efficacy. If I'm going to put time in, you know, I'm thinking uh, microneedling, that'd be the one thing that I'd add in next. Um, yep, great so, overview. Yeah, I guess it's a good transition to my fertility phase, which is not too dissimilar. Yeah, so fertility phase, uh, what are the big changes in the androgen or anti-androgen category? Yeah, um, no dutasteride. And, you know, if depending on the dose of dutasteride, if it's if I've weaned down to one pill of dutasteride per week, around four to six months before uh, desired potential conception, I'll remove that and I'll just go to the topical ketoconazole intelligent shampoo. And uh, I guess technically the topical caffeine is kind of maybe that too, some topical pumpkin seed oil maybe, but really it's mostly the um, ketoconazole driving that anti-androgen. Um, so uh, I definitely have progression of miniaturization when I'm in these phases. So that's why I do a lot more um, and for everything else. Yeah, other ancillary such as under growth agonists. Yep, I like my PRP. Um, I guess I'm somewhat lucky to have uh, you or uh, one of the nursing staff to inject PRP or and or microneedle it in, ideally both. Yeah, very convenient. Um, so yeah, that's a, a great thing to use as kind of like a temporary plug. Um, occasionally for also other reasons, I will uh, use systemic GHKCU, not the foam. But if I have like an Achilles tendonitis, that's definitely not from CrossFit. Then I might <laughs> use that if my IGF-1 is running like 120 and I'm trying to be a little bit leaner in the summer. And again, I'm trying to lead uh, to help heal up, you know, like maybe a rotator cuff tendinopathy. Again, definitely not from CrossFit. I might be on some Egrifta, which is tessamorolin. And that's also a growth agonist. So between the GHKCU um, peptide and the uh, tessamorolin, I, I do notice a bit more growth. I just don't think it's, um, you know, it's, it's an added benefit. If I was, if I'm not taking it for another reason, then it's not going to be in my stack. Yeah, and, and the like any growth hormone or growth hormone secretagogue is going to be pro fertility as yep. well. Yep. So you're not necessarily taking you know growth hormone for hair loss; it's for other purposes. And then hair loss is a side effect that just happens to be a positive side effect of such. Yes. So as I mentioned, I'm better at microneedling and doing scalp injections and basically everything else, just because I'm a little terrified of I'm having a huge regression. I'm okay with just a little bit. Um, Probably because with higher DHT, you actually have the motivation to do it. <laughs> that is definitely not it. No, it's just just pure fear. Like Maddie says, I'm the world's biggest hypochondriac. But um, when I address something, then I feel very at peace. So um, I think about my health a lot, but I actually almost never worry about my health because I just know. Yeah, um, one yeah. of the pros of being a physician. Yeah, uh, that, that's definitely true. There is a little bit of... Um, healthcare provider um, privilege, really. Yeah, I, I think it's like if you work in healthcare, you're you know, going to be in a much better position than the average population. And um, I think we've made the comparison before, whereas if someone works in finance, yep. then you would think it would be the same where they have a bit of a, you know, advantage about how to manage their money and, and get into investments early and be more savers versus spenders because they kind of are doing this for a living and managing people's mm -hmm. uh, wealth accumulation. So they kind of have a leg up on the general population when it comes to yeah. what you can and can't do there. Presumably they should know how, just like athletic trainers should know how to train to improve physical fitness and body composition. Yeah. Um, that's really it for my hair loss stack. If there's any specific questions for mine, I suppose you can uh, just ask and I'll do my best to answer, but uh, I don't think it's overly complicated at all. No, quite simple. And now I guess we can chat about my hair loss stack. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess, uh, uh, how, how do you see things differently between your fertility phases and your non-fertility phases? And what do you start with? And when do you add it in? And when do you take it out? And what are all, yeah. Well, that's a way that my regimen is uh, even simpler because I am not concerned about fertility whatsoever right now. Fertility, I had to look up what that was when we were planning for this podcast, <laughs> actually. Um, but all jokes aside, in my um, DHT or androgen pool, um, I do like to maintain a higher normal level of testosterone. Mm -hmm. I have a longer than average CAG repeat, so in theory, I should be 
uh, less sensitive to testosterone. So that's something that I do think of in the context of uh, long-term um, neurological health, cognitive health, mm -hmm. uh, and then also just things like body composition and um, energy levels, some of those things that people feel um, to varying degrees. But I use uh, dutasteride 0 0.5 milligrams daily. Wow. I have um, not always taken that dose of dutasteride. I started very slowly. Um, and that actually was after trying finasteride. I'll uh, pretend to be very surprised. So you're saying that um, you'd like to have a higher than normal testosterone, but when you want to have a higher than normal DHT, especially if you're um, like not hypersensitive to androgens. Nope, not concerned about it. I trump the, I guess, theoretical need for DHT because I, I don't think that there's a proven need for DHT other than uh, during you know sexual development, uh, during uh, in utero. Like, those are times when I think you would specifically not want to block conversion to DHT. Hmm. But for the average adult male who's, let's say, post-25, because uh, that was actually yep. like myself, I really wasn't doing anything. I may have done some uh, Rogaine on and off prior to age 25. I actually mm -hmm. started um, balding pretty aggressively around age 22. Um, so very early onset. Uh, it seems to run in the family history. Uh, and today, fortunately, I do have more hair than I did back then. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. Um, but when I started finasteride, I didn't seem to react particularly well to it. Um, I was you know, pretty well versed in this space, but you know, hey, I'm 25 years old. I've been reading about these things. And mm -hmm. uh, I actually started with the quarter milligram dose. Mm -hmm. I wasn't taking a whole milligram. I'd seen the charts mm -hmm. and I was like, yeah, I don't really need this much. Yep. And I still did not seem to tolerate it particularly well. Uh, I was still having just this one single side effect where I would sort of compulsively check my alarm clock that I was setting mm -hmm. for the next day each night. And I was like, well, this seems a little bit like OCD and I yep. don't want to reinforce this pattern. Yep. Um, so I dropped it for a time period, um, tried topical dutasteride actually. Uh, that didn't seem to be particularly effective in my case. I, I did use it consistently for about six months. Um, and then we fast forward to today and my stack is a half a milligram of dutasteride daily, one milligram finasteride mm -hmm. daily. And I use a 2% prescription ketoconazole shampoo about twice per week. I think it's about every four days is what I average there. So how are you using more finasteride now? Um, you'd think you'd have four times the side effect if you're on four times the dose. Yeah, and for a while, I was not on finasteride. This was probably, what, something like six months ago, I think I added it in. Um, and I had been on dutasteride for probably a year and a half, maybe close to two years at that time. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in the sort of the theory of the different pools, uh, the different yep. three subtypes of 5 alpha reductase and looking at how you know, dutasteride and finasteride sort of almost fit together like Tetris, if you're yep. looking at which enzymes are inhibited. Mm -hmm. I had a hypothesis that I would add in the finasteride while on dutasteride and not have a resurgence of that. And then for whatever reason, whether it's my theory being proven correct or whether it's just um, a, I guess a placebo positive effect, mm -hmm. um, I've been able to add that in, tolerate it, not have any like adverse side effects, as far as I know. I'm sure yeah. that uh, like sperm counts are down slightly, but that's not something that I have measured at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is something that I have measured, not to skip back to my <laughs> area or whatnot, but uh, yeah, dutasteride certainly affects that. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as the, um, I guess, even inhibition of the isoenzymes, I've certainly heard from patients that are on finasteride plus dutasteride, and even some that are on finasteride plus salt palmetto, that they tend to have less finasteride side effects with the caveat that um, if you have lower total androgens, it is very common to see more side effects that are hypogonadal, but none of the finasteride syndrome side effects, if you will. Yeah, thinking about where these different isoenzymes are active, and we've done a, a whole podcast on this. Uh, fortunately for myself, I didn't have any sort of finasteride side effects. Yep. Um, but we do know that finasteride tends to deplete a, the pregnenolone pool a little bit more mm -hmm. uh, than dutasteride is. And it's sort of a slow, steady drop off. So it's not something that happened day one, the first time I took a pill of finasteride. It was something I noticed probably about two months in, I would say. 
Yep. And I started noticing, hmm, this is kind of odd. Yeah. Um, did you do anything specific to remove other potential confounding variables? For example, a lot of people who are on finasteride or dutasteride, if they have any side effect whatsoever or any change in how they feel, they just kind of assume that it's due to those, you know, surely it couldn't be related to, uh, you know, blood flow because I've been exercising less or surely it's not due to stress or social situation or an episode of prostatitis. It's pretty frequent to see people who have had those side effects in the past that turn out in hindsight to be something else. Yeah, it's certainly possible. I mean, I would say that at the time, uh, like life in general was relatively high stress. I mean, it's all relative compared to what your baseline is and what other life experience you have. But, you know, um, in that time frame of my life, you know, working, um, in, I believe, a couple of different capacities, mm -hmm. um, you know, managing multiple roles, it probably was a slightly higher than average stress time period. Uh, but it was a pretty easy sort of um, initiation and then withdrawal and then um, starting back at even a less frequent dose uh, and seeing those same sort of things emerge. So could it have all been placebo? Mm -hmm. Possibly. Um, but yeah, I guess my theory at this point in time is that with the way that there's relatively equal inhibition of the enzymes, mm -hmm. that now that's why I am able to take both dutasteride and a higher dose of finasteride. Uh, and I, I don't really see myself experimenting with just finasteride solo. Um, it yeah. just doesn't fit my you know, cosmetic or aesthetic goals. Yeah, um, I would agree that it seems like just the, the risk benefit analysis, again, that scale and that balance, um, finasteride solo for a lot of people that have not been on that same dose and tolerated it very well for many years. For people who are changing dose or initiating, um, often not the ideal candidate. Um, so I guess you haven't talked about ketoconazole yet. This is when you can plug the, the Derek's product from Intelligent, right? I have never used that product actually. <laughs> um, I hear it's good stuff. You know, it's a little bit uh, drying, a little bit volumizing. It, get the same effect from the uh, prescription ketoconazole, which is why I don't use it every single day. Uh, I probably use it every three or four days on average, something like that. Uh, but it just, I like using a slightly higher percent. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I could apply double the volume of the intelligent shampoo and get the same milligram or microgram amount of ketoconazole on mm -hmm. my scalp. Um, yeah. That's a lot of shampoo. I mean. How does the influencer or clinic that you go to make money if you are taking <laughs> zero supplements for your hair? Yeah, and actually, I think I get everything we've talked about so far from Mark Cuban's Cost Plus Pharmacy. Costplusdrugs.com. You can look it up. Yeah, <laughs> every single thing is on there. Yeah. Um, but if you come to our clinic, you do have to use our proprietary compounding pharmacies for everything, where you pay the clinic and then we pay them. Yeah, except no, that's, not for that's us. That's a joke. Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually not. Even if you come to our clinic... Um, for everything possible, we also use pharmacies like Cost Plus Drugs. Yeah, we often do because a lot of commercial pharmacies are ripping people off on dutasteride or ketoconazole. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, this is pretty boring so far. Dutasteride, finasteride, ketoconazole. Um, for growth agonists, can you at least talk about some peptides or something like that? That, you know, um, the more research that needs to be done, the stronger it is, right? Yeah. Good old minoxidil. So I, like I mentioned, I used the topical, you know, 5% uh, Walmart brand or Kirkland brand, um, and it was actually quite effective in my case. Um, and I used that fairly religiously. I would use it at least six nights a week. I've been inconsistent with microneedling over time. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but I specifically wouldn't use it after microneedling. Um, and then at some point I was like, well, let's try, um, you know, oral minoxidil. This was probably six months or so before that um, New York Times article came mm -hmm. out where now it seems like every dermatologist is putting people on oral minoxidil. Um, I assume you got the $300 Fagron test to tell you if you're a SALT 1A1 heterozygote or, or homozygote. I did See not. if you're a responder? Yeah. I, I did a in vivo test and saw that I was, in fact, a responder. Mm. So then my decision to switch over to oral minoxidil was more out of convenience and not for a lack of response. Yeah. Um, and I've given some thought to trying both vectors uh, or potentially moving back to a topical. Yep. Uh, but as of right now, I've slowly worked up to uh, five milligrams per day. Um, I've seen as high as 10 milligrams prescribed, but that tends to come with 
uh, hypertrichosis, which I already have without any minoxidil, yeah. uh, even on uh, dutasteride and finasteride. And yep. then also I, I see some fluid retention that could come along with that. Um, you always have the risk of a hypotension that can occur. Um, very small risks, but things where I feel like it's probably not worth doubling the dose from five to 10. Whereas I thought, you know, going from 2.5 to five was pretty reasonable. And yep. I actually start at a half of a, half of a tablet, which is a 1.25 milligrams. Um, very rare, like very rarely, I'll, like never would I put someone on like two milligrams, 2.5 or five milligrams yeah. to start. So I yeah. slowly titrated up um, and something a little bit unique I did here was I bridged, I kept using the topical for about a month while I was introducing the oral minoxidil mm -hmm. and I did not have a shedding phase, which I was fairly well prepared for. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite common when you know, either beginning or discontinuing uh, topical minoxidil or oral minoxidil for that measure to uh, have a shedding phase. Mm -hmm. um, so I was fully prepared for that and pleasantly surprised that it did not occur. Yeah. Um, on that note, uh, of course, minoxidil is a prodrug. Minoxidil sulfate, uh, at least as far as we know, is the active, the most pharmacodynamically active compound. And there's a lot of minoxidil converted to minoxidil sulfate in the liver. So oral generally has a great efficacy. You can see our other uh, multiple hair loss podcast for more discussion into that. Um, I did very briefly use minoxidil once. I don't know if I told you about that. You did it once. Well, I think it, was like, <laughs> it was like four times, but um, I, I decided to grow in these little patchy areas of my beard. So I was going to microneedle and actually use uh, castor oil, um, prostaglandin, and mm -hmm. um, some minox topical. And yeah, that lasted like a week or a week and a half. And um, then have Beard not had growth the- Beard protocol. Yeah, maybe in the future. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as like my, my beard, I think it improved just a little bit while I was on dutasteride. But generally when I'm on dutasteride, I'm on something like 15 mg of test zip per day. And generally while I'm off, when I get all of my unwanted chest and abdomen and back hair, which is not terrible, I can't complain too much as far as like the genetic predispos predisposition, but um, I, I know I get all of that when I am during my, when I'm on my fertility phase, when I'm off my dutasteride, when I'm just on something like just HCG and FSH. Um, yeah, I tend to get a lot of unwanted body hair. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now I guess uh, moving on to my other category, um, I uh, have started with consistent scalp PRP. Um, I guess something I would put under the failed interventions bucket was mm -hmm. uh, scalp uh, neurotoxin. So there's yep. been some studies done with botulinum toxin, uh, Botox specifically. Um, I tried the uh, Zeomin that we administer here in the clinic. I did two rounds about three months apart uh, of 100 units into the scalp. Mm -hmm. I did not see a measurable change there. Um, certainly nothing close to the scale you would see in a responder in the studies. So I decided that the uh, juice wasn't worth the squeeze mm -hmm. there. Uh, and I've since paused putting Zeomin in my scalp and I have started putting Zeomin in my face. Uh, maybe that's a yeah, same uh, topic for another day. Yep. But uh, I've started with a consistent scalp PRP injection, so I'm expecting once I get around to three or so of those, I'll probably do three of them about four or six weeks apart, and then at six months kind of gauge what the effects look like there. And then I have started microneedling consistently. Mm -hmm. um, here's the plug, thanks to the Intelligent Shop microneedling. Okay? <laughs> nice. Uh, I, yeah, I like funny. it a lot better than what I was using prior. What I was using yep. previously had a lot of wires and cords and it was yep. bulky and the cartridges didn't like to stay in the micro so it was a real mm -hmm. pain yep. uh, and that's why I was you know, inconsistent with it because then you know the cartridge would shoot off and then it would break and then you'd have to order more from Europe and that takes time yep. uh, but now with the intelligent shop pin I've been able to do that consistently for a few weeks now so I plan to continue doing that because there's basically no scenario in which it's not going to be beneficial yep um, I'm going up to somewhere between one and uh, 1.5 millimeter depth. Um, you can get erythema or redness quite easily. You could get that from a half a millimeter, um, but I'm trying to target just pinpoint bleeding. Yeah. 
Um, so that you know, that's another metric of um, treatment target or efficacy that they use in the microneedling trials. Mm -hmm. So that's my protocol. Um, I tend to tolerate about once a week, just fine. Um, I'll probably skip you know one week a month if I have you know, like a haircut scheduled the next day or something like that. Uh, something in my schedule where I don't want a very uh, red, irritated, flaky scalp. So I'm probably doing it about three times per month. Um, and then I guess under blood flow uh, exercise, you know, that's a given. Yep. Um, and then I do take Tadalafil five milligrams a few times per week. Um, I have yet to have any kind of you know, prostate issues or, or nighttime urination. Um, I will frequently like uh, drink a whole glass of water right before I go to bed. It's impressive. <laughs> um, I, I think that's probably due to the dutasteride though. Um, and the yeah. fact that my kidneys know when to uh, settle down. Yeah. Excuse me, settle down and Makes not sense. make uh, urine. Yep. Um, so we'll see how long I can keep that up. But uh, wait another five years till he's years old as me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I like the Tadalafil. I, I don't like taking it consistently because I feel like it, for me, it does build up a little bit. Um, I have a little bit of, you know, flushing that may come along with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, uh, erections when they're not supposed to happen can be bothersome. So using a lower dose or uh, less frequency, that seems to be a good mix. Yeah. Um, and then when you are taking it, you're getting a uh, slightly potentiated effect compared to if you were taking it seven days a week. And mm -hmm. again, that's my experience. I've heard this is sort of variable from person to person. Yeah. One thing to watch if you're on both Tadalafil and Minoxidil, not in your case, but if you do have some POTS tendency, some tendency for orthostasis or low blood pressure or high heart rate when you stand up, then both can drop your blood pressure just a little bit. Um, I tend to not take Tadalafil right before my deadlift days. Yeah, that's a great tip. A lot of people are now taking uh, Tadalafil pre-workout. Yep. Um, Watch for back bumps. Substitute for their nitric oxide booster. I think there's even a company out there that calls it the first prescription workout medication. Yeah. Um, which is interesting marketing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely don't want to do it when you're going to be uh, likely to pass out. Yeah or doing anything that could give you back pumps. It, uh, not, <laughs> it's a no-go. Yeah, it's not yeah. great for me. Um, I guess one other thing we could note, if somebody does ask about zeomin or botulinum toxin response, in general, you'd think much thicker scalp um, and really a, a lot of tension, perhaps they have tension headaches all the time, their temporalis is always tight. Some people are still good candidates, um, but Maddie always told me I have a really thick skull, but I, I don't think I have a thick scalp. So the thick skull has caused the scalp to be thinner. I, yeah, I, I, That's I guess directionally so. how that would work. It's like more, more the filling of the Oreo, but less of the outside. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't tend to be a particularly stressed person. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't tend to carry a lot of muscle tension. Um, I don't think that I have a lot of tension in my scalp or I would say my scalp skin is slightly thicker than average. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it, it's not something where I um, like feel like it is substantially thicker yeah. and, and needs to be uh, relaxed in that Certainly. manner. Um, and some people will report less uh, sweating with uh, zeomin or with any kind of Botox injection. Um, I'll say that I didn't necessarily note that. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I didn't yep. measure the volume of sweat output, um, but occasionally I will um, you know, go work out and finish a workout, some hard cardio, uh, wearing a hat. And the hat was quite heavy, regardless of whether I had zeomin in my system or not. Mm -hmm. It's a nice little um, scientific way to measure that. I should have weighed the hat like the, post-workout. It's like yeah. the opposite of a shower drain hair catch, which is also not perfect or ideal. But uh, I guess on that note, any tips for pain control when you microneedle? Because the scalp is can be a very sensitive area, especially around those temporalis muscles. <laughs> not really. Um, I tend to, I feel like maybe the area gets a little bit desensitized if you go over it at like a quarter, um, a quarter millimeter first. Mm -hmm. you know, you're just doing a little bit to kind of warm up the area. Um, but as far as numbing, um, I've tried uh, lidocaine creams, I've tried lidocaine injections. You really cannot numb the scalp well, or at least um, I'm not particularly good at yeah. numbing the scalp. I, I know I am a responder to lidocaine. Uh, I've had some uh, skin lesions removed, uh, you know, precancerous, those sorts of things. I can say that because now I have life insurance. Um, and the lidocaine was yeah. very effective. I did not feel those biopsies. 
um, or the stitches. And then with uh, lidocaine injections directly into the temp uh, temporal areas, um, I still felt the uh, microneedling. It was perhaps about a quarter less intense, but mm -hmm. really not worth the, the time, preparation, and waiting for the yep. lidocaine to kick in. Yep. So uh, basically, you just have to deal with the pain. How about those little vibration creators? They use a lot in, you know, like pediatric uh, urgent cares and whatnot. That could be worth a try for yeah. some people. It may be interesting to try to uh, sort of distract or, or give another sensory input. Um, I, I also tried uh, ice packs, and that doesn't seem to do anything no. either. Yeah, so your results can vary, but in general, the thicker the skin, um, for example, skin on the scalp, very thick. The topical lidocaine creams like Imola and whatnot are just not going to do as good at uh, penetrating through, but um, it is tolerable and it can be done outpatient if your uh, healthcare provider, for example, us, if, if you're going to be in Kansas City, um, kind of shows you what it's like and they show you how to microneedle, although it's not particularly difficult. Yeah, Sometimes tried... people feel best getting one done first in their local doctor's office. Yeah, I haven't tried conscious sedation or anesthesia. You that get, would probably give you substantially so less pain. Ketamine-assisted therapy that distracts you. You, I do my talk therapy do the talk and ther get my microneedling at the same time. Yes. For the right patient, that theoretically <laughs> could work, wildly enough. Um, but uh, maybe that's a, a good place to end it before we go too far down the rabbit trail. Yeah, I think that's a solid overview. So um, like Dr. Gillette mentioned earlier, any specific questions you have, Please leave those in the comments. Um, I'm sure we'll do another AMA. And we're always sort of tinkering and tweaking protocols. So this is probably going to change sometime in the future. Um, I might learn about fertility someday. So until then, this is probably going to be my regimen. But uh, keep you guys on your toes. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your time. And may God bless you with health and happiness.